been reading and studying for a while. For some reason, uh, I keep being taken back to remember when David slew Goliath? Yeah, you know, how many have all heard a sermon on David killing Goliath? 15 million of them, 15 different ways, 15 different approaches, 15 different interpretations. Uh, but I want to talk to you today from a different aspect. Uh, how many of you have felt like there was an opportunity for you to do something, but for some reason you didn't do it and you missed your turn? That happens to me all the time when I'm driving. <laughs> my wife is like, I think that was your turn. And I'm like, oh, really? But you know, the amazing thing about missing your turn is all it does is delay you momentarily. Okay, let me, I want to say this before I get started. There's a lot of prophetic things going on across the nation, and a lot of people get prophetic words, and because they hear something that God says you're going to do or something's going to be happening, how many of you know that you can get a word in season but out of time? That's right. Yes. Right. Come on you can get a word that is, all, that is in the right season, but it's not the right time. For that word to happen in your life. See, in the church, we're chasing after those type things. And then we're expecting God to do it right away. And when it doesn't happen right away, we get dismayed, disgruntled. Uh, we, get, we give up. We think that it's not going to happen. But I come here to tell you today that just because you get a word in season does not mean it is your turn. I go through ministries all the time, and I've had a lot of ministries come uh, to me or join with us that, you know, they get a word about a season, but then they get disappointed that it's not their turn yet, and they get ahead of themselves because it's not your turn. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you hearing me? Yeah. Taking the wrong turn at the wrong time is still a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, are you hearing me? Yeah. Just because you do something that you think God told you to do, yeah. because it is a season, does not mean it is your turn. Right. Come on now. Are, are you hearing me? Come on. A lot of impatient folks in the church. Well, I believe God wants me to do, but you have to wait on your turn. Right. That's right. Come on now. You, and a lot of things have to go on before your turn comes about. All right? All right, I'm just trying to set you up because I look at a lot of your life. And that's where I want you to be. Okay? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Everybody okay? Yes. All right. Now, in case you haven't figured it out yet, the title of the message today is Don't Miss Your Turn. Don't Miss Your Turn. Okay, I'm going to just read a few verses, but I'm going to talk to you about some chain of events. First, let's start with verse 48, and we'll read only through like verse 51. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. How many of you know that the people of God are not supposed to be running from, but running to? When the enemy shows up in your life, can I encourage you to engage him? Yes. Are you hearing me? Come on now. When difficulty comes, you have heard me say, when a difficulty comes into your life, embrace the difficulty. Run to it. Put your arms around it. Thank the difficulty from show, for showing up. You are not to run from something, but to run toward something. Okay, here David is not a soldier. He has not been trained for war. He is a very young man. But when he sees the enemy, something on the inside of him says, run to him. Because he's been scaring everybody to death all day long, 
all week long, all month long. And David said, I'm not going to run from you, but I'm going to... How many of you know that when a bully decides to pick on you, he will pick on you until you stand up to him? See, the church is full of defeated, run-over individuals. Oh, whoa, how you doing? Well, I ain't doing too good. Well, you ain't doing too good because you're running from the very thing that's trying to hold you back rather than running to it. And then you know that the enemy is under your foot, but sometimes you think he's in your face and he... Right? Come on. When you should run to him Come on. to get... Let him, see, when... I, what you do when you run to the enemy is you say, hey, you know what? I'm not afraid. Okay? All right, man. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay, so David quickly ran to me, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and the lion stumbled, fell to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. For he wasn't a soldier. He didn't have a sword. Sometimes you got to fight with what you got. Now check this out. I love this part right here because I've read this time and time again, but I really never saw this. Then David ran over, pulled out Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Sometimes you got to take what the enemy is trying to use against you and turn it on him. Because he's only there to intimidate you. He's only there to try to scare you. And sometimes you got to take his scare tactic and turn it right. Come on now. Come on. I ain't got Come a sword, Goliath, but I know you're trying to intimidate everybody with the one that you got. Come on now. So I'll take what your intimidation is, and I. All right. Let's not get, get excited here. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and they ran. They turned and they ran. Now, I want to get, get. Can I just teach just a little bit? Before I preach any of this, I want to take you back to a to chapter 16. And in chapter 16, you see Samuel, the prophet, who is attached to Saul, the king. And I know he's attached because in the first verse, it says that the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough over Saul. In other words, you have put way too much of your energy into a king that the people chose. He might be the king, but he doesn't have the right heart. He doesn't have the heart to serve. He only has the heart to rule. And so Samuel stopped mourning over the fact that I have decided I, don't, I didn't want Saul in the first place. I didn't choose Saul in the first place. And you are mourning over him and worrying about him. Put that thing away. Get yourself together because I'm about to introduce you to my selection. Come on now. Come on. Okay? The people wanted a king because everybody else had one. So they chose somebody they thought was kingly. He was above everybody else. He was taller than everybody else. He had a deeper baritone voice. He seemed like he was a warrior. He had the body of a warrior. So everybody decided this is the guy that we want. And God said to, to Samuel, I need you to get yourself prepared because I'm even about to shock you with what my choice really looks like. Yes. I just came by here to tell you today that we're entering into a season where you're going to be shocked 
by what God has chosen to use because our mentality and for a long time in the body of Christ is he's got to look good, got to sound good, got to have an education, got to prophesy, got to do it. But God is about to raise up in this season his choice for the season. He's about to choose some folks to come forward that he chose a long time. I just came to encourage you. A lot of y'all got a word in another season and you didn't get your turn. It looked like it wasn't working out, but I just stopped by here to tell you that don't miss your turn because the word that you got in another season was preparing you for, yes. Come on now. Come on now. for your turn. Come on. For your turn. So Samuel goes to the house of David's father. And in verse 5 he says, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And then Samuel says to Eliam, Surely... Surely, as Eliam brings in all of his sons, because you know, I just, I just, I'm kind of quiet because I just heard the Spirit of the Lord say, "It's, it's not the house, and it's not the name." But it is the character. But it is the character. It's not the title. And it's not what you think. It's the character that God's looking for. So Samuel comes to Eliam's house and he says, Get all, get all of your children and bring them into the house. And so... Eliam's daddy goes and gets everybody that he thinks that God would be looking for. Yeah. And he brings the what he thinks is the oldest and the and the best. See, he brings the oldest because it's the custom of the people that the oldest is the one who gets the anointing. The oldest is the one who uh, takes on the lineage. It's the, but see, God takes things that we believe to be true and does them in the way that he wants to do it. You know the Bible says, your ways are not my ways. And I really don't know why we get confused when something out of the normal shows up and rearranges things. And then we go to God trying to find out what's going on when he already said, when it's not working out the way you think it should work it out, it's really working out according to my way. Come on now. So Amen. Samuel has them all paraded in. Come on. And Eliam says, this must be the anointed one right here. Yeah. And Samuel lets them all pass through. Yeah. And, it, and it, it, it's almost as though Eliam is saying, this is all the boys I got. Yeah. I don't have it. These are my choices. Yeah. And God speaks to Samuel and says, but there is still one more. There's still one that has been disappreciated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One that does not look like very much. Yeah. One that does not carry a big anointing because yeah. he's younger than everybody else. Yeah. One that's not as tall as all of his brothers. Yeah. There's still one more. And Eliam goes, I do have one boy. He's the youngest one. And he's out messing with a sheep. He's out you do know that God just said to Samuel, I'm looking for somebody else with a different spirit. My people has chosen a king based on his ability to lead, and I have chose someone with an ability to serve. See, everybody wants to get up and lead, but nobody wants to clean the toilet. Come on now. Come on. Can I just give you a little piece of something? You can't get to the front without spending a whole lot of time at the back. Come on, uh, You ain't going to get to the platform until your hand reaches.
flashes around a mop. Yeah. Come on, man. We're in a season that there is no promotion from the second row to the front row. There's a promotion from the back to the front. It's, I'm telling you, this is a season for the turn of people that everybody else has turned away. And it, Come on. I'm telling Come on. you prophetically something that I know that something is going on in the body of Christ and God is about to raise up individuals with a heart to serve and, and you can't lead until you can learn to serve. Come on. Come on. You, you can't tell your children what to do until they can see you do it yourself. Come on. The age in the body of Christ of do it like I say is coming to an end. Come on. God is saying nobody will follow those who say do it like I say. I'm sending people to follow people who say do it like I do. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. See, y'all got me excited. So, Helium calls for David. And David all stinky and smelly. Yeah. Amen. You do know he's out in the sheep pen. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about you. See, I grew up in the country. Yeah. And, 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 you know, shoveling the sheep pen and the hog pen. And, you know, and you don't smell real good at the end of the day. Uh, you know, in fact, people try to kind of stay away from you because they know you coming before you get here. Amen. Okay? Amen. And, and so, so Eliam is listening to Samuel, consecrate yourself and dedicate yourself and make yourself holy. Not understanding that what's about to be come in, listen to this now, what's about to be chosen to, by God ain't consecrated. It ain't all holy like you think it's supposed to be. It don't look like, talk like, act like the way you, are you hearing me? But you can make it holy. God makes it holy. It doesn't the way you think it has to operate. It only has to operate according to his Amen. I hear you. Amen. Don't miss your turn. So Samuel, but I love this word. I, 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 there's something on the inside of me that tells me that God is about something. It, 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 I, I have never seen a season of where men have brought themselves to a place of prominence yeah, yeah. in the body of Christ. Yeah. Men, have you ever noticed that the ones who fall are the ones who never serve? Come on. Come on. Uh, are you hearing me? Come on. I've noticed in ministry the ones who have the biggest problems are the ones who jump from the second row to the front row. Yeah. They didn't spend very long in the back. Come on. And, I'm already hearing me. I just come by to tell you that if you're looking for me to choose you, don't sit on the second row. Because I'm looking for somebody with a broom in their hand. I'm looking for somebody shaking somebody's hand. I'm looking for somebody doing something that nobody told you to do. And that, because this is the season of servants' heart. I'm hearing me. So David comes in. And Samuel, and Samuel, <laughs> look this verse 13, I love it. And as David stood there among his brothers. Now if you go before that, verse 12 says, so Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome. <laughs> with beautiful eyes. Okay, with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said to Samuel, that's my choice. Now, now listen to me. The Bible says he was dark. Because almost everybody was light. Oh, you hear? For the scripture to write he was dark means he was not like everybody else. I'm just saying you got to read it to understand it. So he, he was dark meaning he was not one that anybody would set their eyes on to believe that this should, because he's different. Come on. Yes. He's different. And God says, Samuel, you might be a prophet, but you can't even see a king. Come on. Come on. Come on. You might carry a word, but you don't carry my mind. 
What is standing before you is my choice. Now go on and read this. So as David stood there among his brothers, all of them, I'm sure, like say, what? <laughs> Come on now. Yes. So the oldest was probably like way over here, like, hmm. yeah. <laughs> got to be a mistake right here. Right, right, right. In fact, this might not even be Samuel. Come on Because something is not right. not right. You ever seen those folks? When somebody else gets chosen over them, yeah. they back way off and like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to wait over here till that don't work. Yeah. But I'm not going to get over there and hip it out. Yeah. Come on. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And so they all are standing there looking at him. It says, Daniel took the flask, Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought. And check this out. And he anointed David. With the oil. Now, if the anointing wasn't enough, read this. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. From that day on. Now, can I stop to give you a little side note? David had some problems in his life, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But the Bible says, that the Spirit of the Lord was powerful on him from that day on. That's right. That's right. See, when, when God chooses you, he knows about your difficulties to come. Oh, yeah. But when oh, yeah. he anoints you and chooses you, he never backs away from you. That's right. 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 Now, right. Now, yes. now, the church is real good. Right. And right. when you fall, back in the way. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess he just ain't anointed anymore. Right. But I just got to reading that when God puts his hand yeah. on yeah. you, it don't make no yeah. difference about nobody's yeah. opinion about you. Because when he comes on you powerfully yeah. with the anointing, yeah. he stays with you from now on. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes, Lord. We are coming to a season. Y'all listen to me. We're coming to a season where the ones who fail took the wrong turn. Don't be surprised when they make the right turn this time. Because they took the wrong turn that caused them to go down the wrong road. But it does not mean that because they took the wrong turn that God took them off the map. Come on now. Come on. Come on. See, I have to tell you that how God deals with people is not how you deal with people. Amen. See, you want him to be long-suffering when it's about you. But you don't want him to be long-suffering when it's about somebody that you hate. Come on. Uh, the way the church today, my wife said to me, she said, you know, I have a revelation. I said, what is that? I'm thinking, you know, she got some word from, she said, Did I have a revelation. You have a lot of haters. You have a lot of haters in your face. You have a lot of haters that you don't know about, but you got a lot of haters. And I said, you know something? That is an encouraging word to me. Come on. So what you're really saying to me is that all these haters yeah. who never wanted me to be are now going to be surprised because it's now becoming my turn. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's not, you didn't really like me, baby, but you don't have to like me because I'm not here to rule and reign. I'm here to serve. Come on. I, I, I came up today to tell you that the heart in the body of Christ has got to change. Come on. And there's some folks who took a wrong turn. And they've been serving for a long time. And really, in reality, they got a word in a season, but it really wasn't there. Can I tell you that a lot of preachers fall because people want them to get on the platform before it's your turn. Right. 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 A, lot of folk, a lot of folks are pastoring churches today that call, were called to pastor. It was a call in a season, but it was not your turn. Right. Come on. Right. Uh, Come on. Yeah, I'm, you're looking at one. Licensed at 15, ordained at 16. 17 preaching in churches with 
eight and nine hundred people, that was a lot, ten thousand back then. Only to wake up one day and say, man, if this is all it is, I'm out. Come on. It, 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 people just pushing you down the line. Pushing you up the, you're going to be this and you're going to be that. And you know, some, you got to be careful who you let into your ear. Oh, yeah. Come on. Because they will push you yeah. out of turn into something that God really called you to do. And then calls you to make a wrong turn. Come on. Yes. Sometimes I think God yes. makes you take the wrong turn. Oh. Come on. Because it ain't your turn. Right. right. And he's putting you like Elijah over under a bush for a season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Come on. Let me Come go on. I, 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 got on. To, I got to finish this. Now verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit. That filled him with depression and fear. Yeah. Now, Saul is the king, but he's about to go through a season yeah. of exposure. Yeah. See, can I tell you that when God makes a change, he exposes the wrong in the current system. Right. Come on. Right. Uh, are you hearing me? Come on. Yeah. Now, check this out. One of the things that the scripture doesn't say is something very important. And when I was reading this, you know, I was really going to preach on slaying your life. But when I was reading this, I saw something that I had not seen or I had not focused on. Samuel anoints David with oil <coughs> So David is now the what? The king. Okay. Samuel the prophet has been given a word manifested in the flesh. This is my choice. Anoint this one. Because he, in my mind, he's the king. In the mind of the people, it's still Saul. Come on. Okay. So, are you here? God makes changes in the supernatural before they ever appear into the natural. Now, now, and the Bible says that the anointing of the Lord came on David strongly and powerfully. And David went down to Nehemiah Marcus and got him a preaching suit. Come on. Come on. David enrolled himself in the seminary. David signed up for King's School. Okay. You know I got to get ready. Come on. You know I'm about to be the king. I got to let me let. Do I look good in this robe, or do I need a Versace robe? But, 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 does my does, does this crown look good? Yeah. The, what side should I take pictures from? No, no, no. David goes back to the sheep pen. Come on. Yeah. David, come, come on. on. Yeah. Why? It's not his turn. Come on. Come on. Wow. He's anointed in a season, but it ain't his turn. Right. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? So David goes back to the sheep pen. And he continues doing what he has always done. Because his daddy told him, it's great that you anointed, but the sheep are still waiting on you. Come on. Come on. You still got a job to do before your turn. So David goes back to the sheep pen. Why? Because he has learned a very simple principle. It's not my turn. And so I must do as I am instructed. Because if I can't do what I'm asked to do, 
I can never ask somebody else to do. Nobody can follow me if I can't follow somebody else. We're living in a season where everybody wants to get in the ministry, but nobody wants to be instructed. Well, the Lord called me. Yes, he did call you, but it ain't your turn. Come on. Come on. Well, who are you to tell me? Well, aren't you the one that's up? Uh, 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 am I not the one you submitted to? Come on. See, Come on. Your, your ministry is going to take a wrong turn down the road because it wasn't your turn right now. Come on. See, Come on. You just wanted to rule. You didn't want to serve. Come on now. Come on. Yeah. And I have seen them come. And I have seen them go. And I have watched them fall. Why? Because just because you get a word does not mean that it's your turn. Are you hearing me? The Lord's called you to travel across the face of the earth. Don't go home and pack. Go back to what you was doing. Right. You see, you, you see, David did not come to, David knew, now listen to me, you know David knew that Samuel was in the house. Really? Really? He's, a, he's one of all these brothers. Everybody's leaving their post and going to the house. It ain't dinner time. It, he knows that Samuel the prophet is here. But did you know he don't go to the house? Yep. Why? Because God's not looking for people who are trying to be found. He's looking for people that he can find. See, most of us don't get found because we move out of our position. And so when God, so when God comes to look for you, he can't find you where you're supposed to be. And so you miss your turn because you got out of place. I told you I got a word. Now listen. I love it. I, I got to get over this because I can preach this all day. But check this out. David, the Philistines are fighting the children of Israel. And Goliath who is nine feet, three inches tall, has been running the entire army rank because he's been challenging the children of Israel. Send me your best. And if your best don't work, we ain't leaving. We're going to stay here and in the middle of your stuff. Yeah. Don't look for your best Bible verse. It ain't going to help you. I know you don't want to hear it. But I just came by to tell you. That when the enemy raises his head. Send something that he don't expect. Right. Okay. Are you hearing me? Rather than quoting a scripture, get in his face. Come on, yes. Are you hearing me? Uh -huh. Because when you quote a scripture, you're quoting it from over here. Right, yeah. right. Are you hearing me? He ain't scared of the scripture. He's scared of the anointing. Right. Are on, you hearing yes. me? Yes. Yes. All right. Come on, yes. So good David word, is still word. in the field. He's been anointed. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> The power of the Lord comes on him powerfully. Yeah. He goes back to the sheep pen. Gives me an indication that the anointing needs to find time to soak into yes. your being. Yes. And, the, and the power that you have, you need to be trained yes. to use. Right. Come on. Uh, are you here? Just because you can speak in tongues, don't mean you can prophesy. Come on. Exactly. Come on. Just because you can prophesy, don't make you a prophet. Come on. Are you hearing me? Come on. Sometimes you got to get the word, get that thing worked in you, yes. get somebody to watch over you, yeah. Yeah. get somebody to instruct. So, oh, and can I tell you, in the body of Christ, we don't like instruction. Come on. Right. Right. I can get that for myself. Come on. I'm going to tell you, 
you know, we are some stubborn folks. Oh, yeah. yes. You know, I, I got that myself. We are a, can I tell you, by far, and I go to churches, by far, the church folk are non teachable. Come on. They're not teachable. That's right. You know why? Because they come to church and they already been to church before they got here. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Yep. Yes. That's right. Can I tell you, and this is a lie, but I'm going to say it anyway. Can I tell you, if you live in San Antonio, Texas, Joel Osteen ain't your pastor. Come on. Call him up. <laughs> See if he talks to you. Yeah. Yep. Come on now. Come we are yeah. folks who don't want to be taught. They, can I tell you, if people wanted to be taught, these chairs would be full. If people were hungry for understanding, the chairs would be full. Right, right. If people were hungry for understanding, they'd be here at 9.30. Mm. Come oh, on. Oh, Lord. Yeah. There's your toes. Yeah. Are you hearing me? <laughs> but we are a folk Come that on. are not teachable. Mm. And then we wonder why we don't. How come I can't teach? Because... Nobody can teach you. That's right. I'm here to tell you, y'all need to hear this. Ain't nobody ever getting into this platform ever that I know are not a servant. Mm. Are you here? I don't yeah. know. I, I, got, I know a lot of big names. I know they ain't coming here if they can't serve. Right. Are you here? Come on. Yeah. And if they come here, they're going to come here to receive what we give them, not come here to get what they want. Right. 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 Amen. What's that, Jeff? This yeah. is a lot. I'm going to get yeah. a lot of stuff like this. Yeah. I told you this last week. I said, you know, we need to have some meetings. And I know some folks that we can call on to uh, come and, and, and have this meeting with us. Now, hold on a second. It's okay. Amen. I said, but the problem is they all want to take up their own offering. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So did you come to lead me? Or did you come to serve me? Come on yep. now. Because if you come to serve me, you come to get what I give you. Right? Yep. Exactly. Right? Yep. Can I tell you, God is a great paymaster. Come on now. And what you collect for you is less than what he wants to give you. Come on right. now. Right? Right? Amen. Amen. Tell the truth. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate it a bit over the last few weeks. And I've had a couple of times say, what do you charge? And I'm like, say what? <laughs> what do you mean? It's an honor for me just to be here. Thank you. Amen. I'm blessed to stand in this holy place. I'm not a prostitute looking for another. Come on. Yes. Come on. I got a word, and you can't pay me enough Come on. for the value of the word I got. Yep. Yeah. And you can underpay me if you want to. That's all right. But I serve a paymaster yep. yeah. Come on. who pays beyond anything you can ever muster together. That's right. Come on now. So, let me give it back to where I'm at. Been, this has been in me now for mm. two and three or four years. Mm. That there's something going on in the body of Christ mm. that is not. Most people are confused because they're looking for something. Yeah. They're looking for the biggest and the tallest. They're not looking for the darkest and the shortest. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're looking for somebody that's second in line. Mm. They ain't anticipating somebody that ain't in line. Come on. Come on. Come on. Not even in the ballpark. <laughs> Ain't even in the house. That's right. <laughs> oh, good word. So listen, I gotta get this done real quick. So Eliam sends for David, and David's brothers are in battle. Mm. And he <clears throat> says to David, David, take these sandwiches mm. to your brother. Mm who are on the front line in battle. Mm. David could have said, who are you talking to? No 
don't you see the anointing on me? I've been out with the sheep, but don't be confused. I'm still the king. I, you need to be what yourself, because one day I'll be ruling you. Now, that's what most of the church would have done. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, Pastor, you all made us be the Lord. I've been coming here for eight years. Oh, good Lord. Really? You need to look at me. I used to lead Sunday school. Serving you mature. 
you mature to the day that you're supposed to step to the front. God is not promoting prematurely sit down, shut your mouth, don't try to find me. If God wants you, I'll find you. Oh, well, I'm going to sit up here next to the preacher so he can see me. Hallelujah. Sit down. Be quiet. Don't try to get up front. Because if God, can I tell you, God can find you where you are. Are you hearing me? You, you don't want to be found by man. You want to be found. You do know you never look for him. He's been chasing you all your life. He knew where you were, what you were doing, who you was hanging out with, what you were saying. And then you come to church, hallelujah. And then he... Come on now. And he still come to get you. He still come. Can I leave you with this word? Stay where God can find you. Oh, he's omnipresent. He always knows where I'm at. Yes, but you don't. Amen. That's right. That's right. You don't. In the church, we continually try to get out of our place and wonder, I don't know when they're going to give me a chance. It ain't your turn. Every time you jump to the front, I might be looking for where you used to be. And I can't find you. Can I tell you? I, I, I got to stop here. I, I got one, but I, I got to stop here. Let me leave you with a couple of points. Number one, you cannot disappoint what God appoints. If something or someone is appointed by God, you cannot do enough to disappoint them. Unless they have a spirit of soul and they're leading and not serving. A servant is never disappointed. Can I tell you something? I used to be disappointed by numbers. Until one day, I'm taking all of my crap to God. God, I said that. And I'm complaining. <clears throat> and I complained, and I complained, and I complained, and I complained. And all of a sudden, I heard him say, who do you serve? Who do you serve? Because if you serve me, I have appointed you. And if I have appointed you, no one should disappoint you. Right. Don't be disappointed once you have been appointed, David, just because after your appointment, you got to go back to where you were. Because in, it's not in your appointment that the value of your call is. It's in your understanding of the one who appointed you. David, I appoint you and anoint you king. But if I made you the king right now, you would be just like Saul. But I'm going to anoint you and appoint you so that nobody can ever disappoint you. You're going to do a lot of stuff bad in your life, David. But i got to make sure that you're after my own heart. If I'm not, what I have appointed is going to get disappointed. Are you hearing me? You're not going to always be perfect. 
So don't let naysayers and haters disappoint what God has already appointed. If you put your eyes on serving Him, then more than serving this, you will never be disappointed. Man will disappoint you, but God never will. Sometimes we think that when God pronounces a change, that that time is our turn. I got a word. You know how many words I got that still ain't come to pass yet? Why? It was not even the word's turn. I got a word, but I have to wait on the word's turn for my turn. You can get, can I tell you, if you get a word, can I tell you something? Listen to me. If you get a word, if somebody records it for you, put it where you can't find it. Exactly. Yes. Don't listen to it every day. Mm -hmm. You're going to make the wrong turn. When the word is in the due season, it'll activate your turn. Are you hearing me? Because a word from the Lord is a creative word. Amen. And you can be nowhere. And when it's your turn, that word will create your opportunity. Come on now. Are you hearing me? You ain't got to call folks, can I come preach? They'll find you over. You might right. be a mechanic under a car. Right. Somebody will find you. Right. When, yep. But I know they told me I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And, well, I guess I'll go back to turning my wrenches. Good. That's where the world will be looking for you at. Yep. Right. Right. Are you hearing me? Just a couple more things. You can miss your turn. By moving out of time. A word from God is not always going to happen immediately. We live in a society where we want everything right now. And so we take our natural beings and our natural attitudes and we try to apply them in the supernatural and then get confused because, you know, there's an iPhone 10. I want it. But your rent's due. I'll pay them late. Why? I got to have it. Then we get saved and we take that same attitude into the supernatural. I got to work. I don't know why it ain't happening. I want to do it now. It ain't your turn. Let me close by telling you a story. Years ago, I got a call from a pastor that I had never met. My wife and I had a mutual friend who lived in another state up in the northeast. I got a call out of the blue and this guy says, you don't know me, but I'm Pastor so-and-so. And I really would like for you to come and speak. I said, okay. He never said, I'll send you a first-class ticket. He never said he was going to send me a ticket. Now, this is in Oregon. I'm in San Antonio. I can't get in a car and drive. I can, but I'll be there in about three weeks. <laughs> now, God had already given me a word like four years later that I was going to go to the state of Oregon. All I knew is it was on the map up close to Canada. So what happens is I decide that I'm going to go, but I decide that I'm going to go 
to preach for him. I decide that I'm going to preach for him. And so I tell my wife, I'm going to take some vacation time. And I'm going to go. You know, I was all excited until I found out the plane ticket was like 1400 bucks. And it was in a season where I didn't have 1400 bucks. But I had a credit card. So I charged the flight on the credit card. Now, I'm getting to a point. So I fly to this church. Luckily, the mutual friend that my wife and I had there was very wealthy. She put me in a hotel, gave me a rental car, and she paid for it, all of it. So I get up and I go to this church. And when I get to the church, there's 10 people. 10 people. For a moment, I was disappointed. I sit in the very back, and I'm thinking $1,400. I didn't have it then. I ain't going to have it when I get back. In fact, I'm $1,400 more in debt. And it don't look like there's $1,400 in here. I'm just going to be honest. So I get up to preach. And there was an unbelievable anointing in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One that still shakes me. There is no doubt in my mind that that appointment in that church had nothing to do with the pastor. It had everything to do with me. Yeah. Are you willing to serve. So we preached. They took up a little offering. Honestly, I couldn't even buy lunch with it. And the person that took me up there took me to lunch. And I'm going to come back and all of a sudden he says, this, this, this pastor says, you know what? Will you please go with me tomorrow to this Christian luncheon meeting. I've been to them before. Business Christian, business guys. Yeah, yeah. It's not my scene. And I'm like, man, I really want to go home and figure out how I'm going to pay this 1400 bucks. So I said, okay, I'll go. So I go. And in this meeting, they asked me to get up to speak. Nobody told me. And so I get up to speak, and these guys take up an offering. No, it wasn't 1400 bucks. And in this meeting, he introduces me to another guy who's a pastor in the meeting. And the guy says, you're here by divine appointment. No one really. He said, but not for me. It's for somebody else. He said, would you stay over and meet me for lunch tomorrow? I want to introduce you to somebody. Honestly, I'm still like, I hope he's got 1400 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is sitting right there. She'll take it the time I went to work and put it on my credit card. So the next day, he picks me up for lunch. And we drive off out of the city. And we go to this restaurant that I guess they called it a restaurant. Looked like a hut to me. And we're sitting down. And he looks up and I can see his expression change when somebody's coming in the door. In comes this guy that's, I don't know, five feet, six, five. He's got on the shorts, flip-flops, and a t-shirt that looked like he worked in it for four days. And I'm still thinking, this is my divine appointment. I hope he's Paul. <laughs> <laughs> he 
either that or John the Baptist because he certainly smells like he's been someplace. Then. And he comes in and he sits down and he said, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to take a bath before I came. I've been cleaning the church. And I'm still going, I'm like, I don't know what I really am. Come on. I'm still thinking about my 1400 bucks. Then we sit there and he says, you know, I heard that you were here. And I want you to come to a celebration that the churches that I oversee are having. I'm like, dude, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, from the looks of you, I ain't getting my 1400 bucks. I'm just being honest. I told my wife several times on the phone, you know, I didn't even get enough money to even begin to pay for this. Thank God somebody's paying for the hotel or I'm in a bit somewhere. So I'm like, okay, let me, I, you know, let, let's keep talking. So I get up to go to the restroom and I go to the restroom and God said, turn around and go back. I'm like, well, I gotta go. He said, no, you got to go back. Because I go to the restroom with it to kind of break the conversation because I'm like, I'm out of here. So I go back and sit down and he says to me, you know, I come from Georgia. And he said, I pastored a church in Georgia that had over 3,000 people. He said, and I had a dream. And God showed me the city that we're in. I didn't even have a clue where this city was. He says, so I blew it off, so I went back. And the next night I had another dream. And God showed me a building. And about three nights later, he said, I had another dream, and God showed me a state. And I said, okay. That's all cool. He said, so I came here with nothing. I didn't have a job. I left the church. I had 3,000 people. My wife thought I had lost my mind. But we've been married for a long time, and she figured if she followed this fool this long, she might as well keep following me. And we came to this city, and we didn't know anybody. And when I had the first church meeting, we had two people. And he said, and God gave me instruction. He said, when this church grows beyond 500, he said, now you got to understand, 3,000 to 500, I mean, this still isn't what I had. When it gets to 500, I want you to take the best musicians, the best leaders, and send these people to another part in the city. And when that one gets to 500, do it again. And when you get to 500, you do it again. And I'm like, okay, that's good. He said, and so, every month, we have a celebration of all the churches in this area. And I'm thinking, okay. Now, this is a long story, but there's a point to it. So, I'm going to this thing, and he says, will you come and, and speak? And I said, okay. We pull up to this building, and it's a mall. My thought is, I guess he has a church in the mall. <laughs> this is pretty cool. And we walk in, and this young guy meets us. And he said, uh, this is the first time I ever heard somebody call an apostle. He said, apostle so-and-so is vacuuming the church. And I'm early. It's like 45 minutes before. But he wants me to show you around. I said, okay. He said, by the way, I'm the pastor. I said, okay, good. And we walked by this one area. <laughs> 
that, you know, if you go to the mall, it's kind of like, look like maybe J.C. Pitney's or Dillard's or something like that. He said, uh, this is our sanctuary. And I look inside. He said, but it's never full. This is pretty disappointing. <laughs> it ain't full. He said, but it's never full because we can sit like 1,500 people, but we never, ever get to 1,500 people. So I said, okay, I'm not even thinking about what I was told. So he said, so we walked around, and then we get to the sanctuary. Church has to start for 30 minutes, and there's 4,000 people in here at least. And I said, boy, these people come early. He said, no, these people come early to get a good seat. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, probably there will be between nine and 10,000 people here by the time church starts. Now, let me say this. I get up to speak. I haven't talked about an offering. I haven't talked about anything. My whole mind is on my 1,400 bucks. And now I've got to go back home and tell my wife, you know what, well, we've got to pay the 1,400 bucks now. We didn't have it. Did we have it? We didn't have it, did we? After the church, after the service, you know when you preach, you really don't want to have a long service afterwards because that just means that the offering you're going to get isn't going to be real good. You know, you have an altar service and it goes on for like two and a half hours. You're like, well, I guess the offering's out the window. So we had, I mean, we didn't get out till like one o'clock in the morning. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I never forget what I preached on it, I won't tell you, but it was unbelievable. And before we got ready to leave, the pastor said, well, the apostle, this, and, and can I tell you, this is how I know who apostles are. Okay? They reproduce themselves. Okay? They don't have a need to hold stuff. Okay? And he gives me an envelope. And he said, I'm sorry that I disappeared during the service, but I wanted to make sure that you got the offering correctly. So, so I'm like, okay, if I just put it in my pocket, you know, really, I really wasn't really thinking about it. So I get ready to leave and I get back to the hotel. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord say to me, are you still disappointed? And I said, no. I'm just tired. He said, I don't want you to ever be disappointed. And he said, open the envelope because I'm going to show you something. If you don't allow people to disappoint what has been appointed, you will never be dismayed. I opened the envelope, and I'm not going to tell you, but it was in the thousands. But you have to wait your turn. Sometimes your turn comes at your cost. David... You're going to be the king. But you're going to have to serve those sheep for a long time. But I won't disappoint you. Because I have already appointed you. Can I tell you? Don't miss your turn. Don't turn too soon. But don't miss your turn. Stand to your feet. If God has called you to something, don't worry about the time, Abraham. You might think that you're too old to birth anything. But the one who appointed you is the one who created you. You might think you, can I tell you, God only shows up when you run out of time. 
But you know why you think it's out of time? Because you're controlled by time, but he's not. He doesn't care if you wait one year, five years, 20 years, 30 years. He doesn't care. But what he does care about is will you take your turn when your turn comes? Or will you try to take somebody else's turn? David's a king. The only people he's ruling is some sheep. And they hard-headed. They run off. They try to get through the fence. You got to fight the bears and the wolves for them. They smell bad. They stink. They got bad issues. But will you wait your turn? So, my question to you is this. What has God called you to do? That you have become disappointed by your appointment. Because for some time you have moved out of turn. Okay? Okay.